and welcome to tonight's Young Gun of Wine 2020 Top 50 Winemaker virtual event. For those new to Young Gun of Wine for 14 years now, we've been searching for and celebrating new emerging winemakers and young wine labels. And every year we roll out a, a Top 50 Winemakers as well as awards for the best of the best. And tonight, amongst those top 50, we're looking at a contingent from Tasmania, as well as a few winemakers making Pinot from both the Apple Isle as well as the mainland. But before I get into that, because we're on the topic of Tasmania, uh, I'd just like to note that uh, the Australian wine industry and the Tasmanian com community is, is hurting and heartbroken right now. Last Wednesday, Vaughan Dell of Sinapius, who is who was 39 years old, uh, passed away from a heart condition. He's the sort of winemaker that's emblematic of the ilk of producers that we're looking at tonight. Vaughan and his wife, Linda, dove deep into the wine game at an early age, buying a, a vineyard in 2005, and they've invested tremendously into that, that vineyard. And it, the type of agricultural pursuit that they're that they're uh, engage with there is 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 one of the, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. They have planted dozens of, of varied clones of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Riesling and Gamay and and Pinot Gris plus Grunewald Liner, Pinot Blanc, and Gewurz Tremina. That Vaughan won't be there alongside his wife Linda and their two daughters to carry their dream through is a tragedy. If you'd like to purchase some of their wines, yeah, you can do so from their website, which is snappiest.com.au, and know that in addition to enjoying crafted wine from a, tr a truly dedicated wine grower, that the sales will help support the family and business in this challenging time. So tonight, back to the topic, main topic for tonight, we have eight winemaking guests here this evening to chat, as well as special guest uh, Pip Anderson, uh, dialing in from Hobart. Pip's uh, similar to Mona in, in Hobart. And she's also been a member of our tasting panel for the last number of years. And before we get Pip on, just uh, some words about the format of the event tonight. We're inviting you to submit questions. Uh, you'll find those uh, the place to submit questions on our uh, younggunofwine.com event webpage, which you're, cu you're currently viewing from, just beneath the the video, the the window with the live feed, you'll find a pane to to propose your questions, and and we'll receive those, and we'll put those forward to our winemakers as as we go through tonight. And as well, we really encourage you to jump on board to Twitter, use the hash, hashtag #ygow, and post your comments, any thoughts that come to you from tonight, and uh, we'll grab some of those and put them up on the screen. And also tonight, if you find some of the jargon or technical uh, terms sail over your head, don't fret. Uh, we're, we've been establishing a glossary of, of handy terms that uh, pop up time to time, particularly when you're chatting with winemakers and sommeliers. And we've got those on our website at younggunofwine.com slash winespeak. So with all of that, let's have a quick uh, geography lesson and look at some of the wine regions. Uh, that we're exploring this evening. At today's top 50 virtual tasting, we're looking at, as mentioned, Pinot from three different Australian regions, as well as diving into Tasmania. In Victoria, we have a Yarra, a Yarra Valley Pinot from DCB and across to the Mornington Peninsula with Matara wine. Uh, these two regions are dueling for top billing rights of Pinot in Victoria. And then across Bass Strait to Tasmania, where Pinot makes up 41% of the grape production, Australia's island state is 240 kilometres from the southernmost point of Victoria, and it is officially recognised as a single wine growing region. The youth of Tasmania as a region no doubt accounts for it being lumped in as one zone, but when you consider that it takes three hours to drive from Davenport to, in the north to Hobart in the south, this seems somewhat too much of a generalisation. Uh, there are seven unofficial sub regions in Tasmania. We continue the Pinot Noir theme with Tutan Tasmania from the Tamar Valley. And Tassie makes just 0.9% of Australia's total wine production. It's a minuscule amount, but with six makers in this year's top 50 list, the place has a massive reputation for premium wine. Also in Tamar Valley and also in this year's top 50 is the Riesling-focused Wellington and Wolf project. 
from north of uh, Tasmania to the south in Huon Valley in the Don to Castro Channel. Today we'll look at a Riesling with Mewstone and a Pinot Noir with Sailor Seek's Horse. Whilst quite, quite mutiny and making a Riesling in nearby Derwent Valley just northwest of Hobart. Rounding out the top six makers in this year's top 50 is Small Island Wine. Today we'll look at their Chardonnay, which is sourced from a remote vineyard just outside of these unofficial wine regions. So there we have it. Um, and with that, I'd like to bring on Pip Anderson from Hobart. Darling in from Hobart. Hey, Pip, how are you? <laughs> hey, Rory, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you for Good. joining us. So, My Pip, pleasure. Tell us. A Sydney cider that migrated to the coldest part of Australia. What the hell's going on? What brought you down there? And what's it like living yeah. there? Yeah, you are, you're not wrong. And today's been our coldest day of the year so far, and it's still bloody frosty, I will say that. Um, yeah, you're correct. Sydney cider moved down to Hobart. Uh, when I got down here four years ago, did a bit of vineyard mucking around with Stargazer Wines and then jumped on board with Curly from Vintage Tasmania doing wine education through the Wine Spirits Education Trust. And then Mona called and did not stop calling. And that's probably the biggest thing I love about it. They are passionate about what they do and they definitely wanted me on board. So that's what I do now. Um, I love, love Tassie. It's a different hustle down here, uh, but we are a tourist destination and I will plug that now. We need your help, everyone. When the borders open, we need you back down here visiting us and drinking our wines and having a great time, but it is a great community down here. I live in a street with winemakers as my neighbours, a distiller down the road, a community orchard in my backyard, um, and it's a wonderful place to be. Well, I, I can certainly vouch that uh, I've always enjoy, enjoyed my trips uh, to Hobart. We were lucky enough to hold our awards there at Mona during Dark Mofo, yes. and the place is going yes. off. It's when's great, next, and we are when, missing our winter festivals this year. Will it be back next year? It, it'll be back. It'll definitely be back. You can't keep Mona down. You can't keep Dark Mofo down, that's for sure. We'll be back. We'll be right. weirder. We'll be darker. And we'll challenge you even more. Terrific. So jumping into this year's top 50, Absolutely. how many wines have you got in front of you right now? I've got, I've got six. I've got eight. Wow. I lie. I've got eight. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. how about you, you step us uh, through uh, each of them very briefly and uh, give us your take as the expert som how how you'd pre present it in a restaurant setting or or what what type of foods you might think to to pair the wines with absolutely um i will jump on the ladder there i am in isolation uh working from home as we all are down here in tassie and our borders stay locked down uh for the foreseeable future so i'm missing the local restaurants down here and i'm missing my comrades i'm missing my friends and i'm missing their great dishes so I'd love to talk through about each wine and pretty much the dishes I'm missing down here that would go great with all of these. So the 2019 Wellington and Wolf Riesling, a uh, fantastic wine from Hugh, a uh, beautiful textural, refreshing, great stone fruits, beautiful saline acidity. And tonight I am missing from Willing Brothers, their squidding pasta with calamari and lemon. Those two wine, that wine and that food just matches so beautifully together and just makes you want to keep finishing that bowl as quickly as possible. Um, second wine is the 2019 Quiet Mutiny Riesling. This is from Gria Carland, a fantastic winemaker, also produces the wines for Laurel Bank. And I am missing my local pub. My local pub is the Winston Bar and their spicy buffalo chicken wings with this wild and citrus and zesty Riesling is just something to die for at this time, especially when it's so cold down here. Um, next up is Mewstone. And Al, love Johnny's wines. So Johnny's got this Mewstone vineyard down at Flower Pot. And I find this wine, beautiful coarse stone fruits, lovely lemon, citrus, that great racy acidity. But he's got a touch of sweetness to this wine, which is, I find absolutely alluring. And on the weekend, I was lucky enough to imbibe in a bowl of Oddfellas Spicy Ramen by their chef Ben Hay. And that spiciness and that chilli that goes with this sweetness is just to die for. Um, 
I do drink a lot of this wine. I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and moving on to James's 2019 Small Island Chardonnay. James is such a dynamic character down here in this wine industry and he's really challenging the borders and he's really finding different parcels of vineyards. And as you said, Rory, he's finding sites that are even outside our unclassified sub-regions that we've got. That Chardonnay's got lovely peach stone, nectarine, quite pithy and textural and would be fantastic with a great pasta. Uh, Sunny's Bar down here does a Tellagio and potato raviolo with burnt butter that is just to die for. And with that wine, you would find that bottle empty as quick as possible. Mm -hmm. um, reds, reds. And I will take the opportunity to say this just because I'm a sommelier and you have to do these things. Glassware matters, people, everyone. Um, find the glassware you love. Don't buy 15 different types of glassware. You don't need the ones that are all per variety, but find the glass that you love. It really makes a difference in your glass, in your wines that you're drinking. But moving on to Sailor Seek's Horse, 2018, Paul and Gilly, down in the Huon. This is such a vibrant, perfumed, potpourri, lovely, dark, a little bit brooding underneath as well that I do find you get out of the Huon. And there's a richness to it as well, which is fantastic. And I will do a self-plug here. And the sauce at Mona does an amazing venison steak tartare. It's something we're known for, and with this wine, it is an absolute match in heaven. Two ton, two ton back up in Tamer. Um, good old Ricky Bobby gets upset when we call him Ricky Bobby. Hi, Ricky. This is the 2019 TMV, and just that lifted florals again. The beautiful what you know Pinot for the lovely red cherries, black cherries, rose petals. But there's a fantastic. What people refer to in Pinot, and especially the, people, the Pinophiles that are passionate, is you should look for in a Pinot, is a peacock's tail. It's when you take that first smell and that sip, and that wine just fans out in the back of your palate. It's beautiful, it's ethereal, and every Pinot has it. You've just got to hunt for it, but the better ones just flare up like a male peacock and just show you all of their colors. Um, I find that wine delightful and I do drink it quite often when I'm down at Templo. Um, and their fresh pasta, their pappadelli with beef ragu is unbeatable. And those are my Tazis that I absolutely love and passionate about. And then we head back to the mainland. Um, Matara. Matara is fantastic. Coming out of Mornington. Very classic in its Mornington style. That red, black cherry fruit. Very earthy. First time I heard of it was that, you know, term of beetroot, that earthy beetroot note to that wine as well. And something that I just think, yes, it's Pinot, but steak fritz. Have a great, great plate of steak fritz, good quality steak. Eddie's down here does probably the best steak fritz I've ever had. And that's a great wine with it. And then swinging back up to Yarra Valley, DCB with Chris Bendel. What a wine. What a showstopper. Uh, again, Lovely cherry aromas too, but that rose and that lift and almost like a raspberry, dried raspberry note coming through as well. And those tannins just go for days and days. I mean, what a showcase. Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot, these are all my loves and these are all my favourite things. Pip, amazing job. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and on the, on the topic of glassware, I see we've got the same glasses being the uh, read all over two magnums. Great minds think exactly. Like. These these yep. are my favourite glass, bar none. I agree with you. One of, one of one of the banes with good glassware is that they can break so easily, and this is a fantastic fine crystal glass, but it's not prone to breakages all, all, all the time. And furthermore, it's a glass that works with absolutely everything. So if you only going to need if you only Agreed. need one glass, you only want one glass, or the first glass that you're buying, this is where you should start. Um, I love them. They uh, they they work all the time, every time. And, Agreed. And indeed, you know, I when, when, it's so funny when it comes to when it comes to friends' birthdays or Christmases. I'll often buy them a stack of these, so I know when I go around to their place, I've got, we've got some good wine glassware to drink out of. 
<laughs> um, Rory, the gift so. that keeps giving. <laughs> hey, Pip, before I let you go, yes. just quickly, what do you think is the story coming out of Tasmania right now? As you said in the introduction, um, you know, Pinot is 41% of the planted grape varieties down here. But, you know, then you follow quickly behind that with Chardonnay, that's 18%. And then Riesling's 8%. So that's only 60% of the plantings down here. That leaves 33% that are so many undiscovered finds down here. There are incredible grape varieties that you should be hunting out down here. And winemakers are doing a great job. And a lot of these winemakers that you're talking to tonight are also planting and growing these grapes. We have things like Gamay, Syrah, Schon, Schonberger, Gruner Vetlina, Trousseau, Dornfelder, Gewürztraminer, Cabernet Franc, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Gris, Savion Blanc. Fantastic varieties that are going excellent down here in the cool climate that is Tassie. So hunt them out. Love it. Love it. Pip, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Rory. Have good good to see you. You too. Okay, so let's get cracking. Our first wine tonight, Wellington and Wolf. It's an entirely, it's a project entirely focused on Riesling. It's made by Hugh McCullough. Let's get Hugh on the line and have a chat. Uh, this is his Riesling from the Tamar Valley. Hugh, thank you so much Good for evening. joining us. Thank you for having Tell me. Us, it's wonderful you... to be here. Oh. Tell us, where, where did your passion for Riesling come from? Riesling was the first wine that I tried when I was working behind a bar and thought there's something more to this than just pouring some in a glass of booze. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wine that endlessly fascinates me. It's a wine that can age forever, comes from all over the world, and um, I get just super excited every time I open a bottle. So, mate, you're an American by birth who was raised in England, who yes. discovered wine while in Scotland, and now you've landed in Tasmania. How, how did you wind up here? Um, I got here um, because I was working in South Australia, um, chasing Riesling, working in the Eden Valley, um, and met my soon-to-be partner up there who said, you need to check it out. So I came down to Tassie and... Um, worked at a winery up north and was hooked by everything. It was the landscape, uh, the people, uh, the wine community, and the fruit just jumped out of the tanks that I was working with, and uh, I, I couldn't stay away. So we're looking at now the 2019 vintage of uh, your Wellington and Wolf. The project, I believe, started from the 2017 vintage. Uh, what was your first go at uh, making your own Riesling like and, and, and what did you learn? Um, well, it was a very small amount of fruit. Um, I cobbled together everything I'd saved traveling and working in wineries and managed to get my hands on 1.1 tons, which ended up being about 70, 70 or so cases. Um, it didn't end up fitting in the press um, that I was borrowing from a friend and had to put it through a little basket press, um, which is very hard work. Um, we ended up having to foot trot it for about eight hours to get any juice out of it. But um, that really was the starting point for the whole, um, I guess, the style of Wellington and Wolf. It gave me the confidence to say to realize um, that skin contact is a good thing. It um, the power of the fruit here, the ripeness levels, and the um, depth of flavor can stand up to a lot of maceration on skins, um, which brings out all the depth of flavor that we get down here um, while balancing the really natu high natural acidity that we get in Tasmania. And I've never really looked back from that. So this one you've got here, the 2019, has about eight hours of skin contact. Um, and that's just one of the ways that I like to showcase and balance the uh, beautiful acidity we get down here that um, Pitt mentioned a little bit before. Uh, Hugh, I love I love what you've done done with this wine. It's uh, it's got some gorgeous uh, citrus and uh, honeyed characters, and there's a real uh, there's a real um, there's there's a real textural component on the on the palate as well. There's there's floral characters in there as in in there too. What what um, 
What do you see tra translating from be it vineyard or winemaking into the glass here? Well, everything starts with, with good fruit and we have an abundance of that down here. In, in Tasmania, the climate is perfect. We have wonderful long ripening seasonings, seasons, particularly for things like Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot. Um, and after that, I think it's all about balancing as many parcels as you can um, to build a tapestry uh, in one bottle. It's something that's layered and complex, and that's something you can do down here in Tassie. I do a lot of barrel work. Um, as well as that skin contact to uh, build texture. And the vineyard that I work with is in the Tamar Valley. It's a slightly warmer um, region for us down here in Tassie. And I think that's what you're smelling in there. It just gives you all these different kinds of citruses, mandarin peel to curd mm -hmm. to zest. And uh, it's a wine that I am very proud of. I absolutely love it and um, hope to do many more vintages like this in the future. Great. Uh, Hugh, thanks for joining us. Stick around. We're going to come back to you later where we, when we'll field some questions from the audience. Okay, and with that, let's move on to uh, our next wine. Another Riesling. This one from the Derwent, Vill uh, Derwent Valley, rather, just uh, further south in Tasmania. It's made by Greer Carland. We'll get Greer on the line to have a chat about it. Uh, Derwent Valley is just uh, northwest of Hobart. Greer, are you there? Hi, Rory. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Thanks, thanks so much for for uh, for joining us. Pleasure. Um, looking at uh, looking at this wine, uh, we we um, we see a bit of skin contact going on uh, in this wine, and, and you you mentioned uh, that that. Uh, he's been employing some skin contact with with his wines, which is probably quite an un unconventional thing when we think about riesling in in, a, in Australia. How 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 common uh, it, do you find uh, working with the skins in the making of riesling to be? Look, I think um, skin contact in making riesling in a, in an Australian context is is not super widely used, but definitely in the Euro European context, it is quite widely used. Uh, so that was certainly the inspiration for me. Um, I've been making wine for a good seventeen years, mostly for other people in contract wineries, and I've made a lot of rieslings, a lot of really beautiful rieslings for Tassie winemakers. Um, uh, for Taddy producers, sorry, and I'd never made a wild Riesling before. Uh, I had done skin contact, um, so it was a bit of a, a journey for me to explore a territory that I was really excited uh, to learn uh, a little bit more in, and, and I think I've found a really nice place uh, with this wine. You, ju you just mentioned wild Riesling there. Are you talking about a, a wild ferment? Yeah, yeah. So I use a little bit of wild ferment in this batch as well, um, which um, again is just building you a little bit of that mid palate volume, mid palate presence. Um, but letting, in, if you do it with a good balance and good focus, um, you can still have the fruit being the hero of the wine, um, and just using those skin contact elements and wild ferment elements as a, as, a, as a layer behind the fruit. And do you just want to explain for us briefly what we mean by the term wild ferment? Ah, so um, wild ferment is basically when you let the yeast that come in from the vineyard uh, to do the fermentation job. So very uh, traditional in many ways, I guess. Um, but in modern winemaking, it's used very much as a tool to um, capture uh, just a different way, a different way of revealing the, the fruit and the flavours and the nature of the grapes that you've got. Um, so in my case, in this wine, I've only used around a quarter of it as wild ferment because wild ferment does build you a lot more volume and texture and uh, different flavours, like um, you can get sort of more um, um, different flavours that aren't primary fruit. So you can get, for me, I find that this has got a little bit of uh, Riesling Friand, 
uh, sorry, lemon friand or something tiny bit nutty, tiny bit of like sort of yogurty creme. Um, and I see that yeast. So you you want to sort of get a beautiful balance of that. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. <laughs> So um, yeah, so, look, uh, wild ferment is a really great how, way. So you've 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 experimented with what you've experimented with um, uh, wild fer ferments and inoculated ferments in the same vintage from the same parcel of fruit. How how, how would you what what differences did you did you observe from those uh, observe from those two different approaches? So the batch that I have uh, that is inoculated, I actually use a sparkling yeast because I want the very linear, fine, focused um, wine to come out of that parcel. And the batch that I have made with the wild ferment, uh, I get a great generosity. It, it really um, makes the fruit a lot uh, more voluminous, um, that really emphasises those lovely um, citrus characters, those sort of mandarins and um, beautiful limes, um, and a lot of texture. Like it's very rounded, if you will, whereas the tank one that's inoculated is very linear. So together they make a beautiful partnership. And this one's uh, come from the Derwent Va uh, Valley, your family's property, I understand. Yeah, How yeah. How, how would you observe or describe the sub-regional differences between the Tamar, which uh, we've just looked at with Hughes wine, this wine, and, and from here we're going to, to Mewstone in the Don Castro channel? How yeah, would we're you, really how fortunate. Would you... Sorry, go Describe ahead. the differences, sorry. Mm. <laughs> uh, look, yeah, we're really fortunate in Tassie that we've got so many awesome sort of sub-regions that have quite distinctive characteristics, like lining them all up. Um, and I'm sure you can go back to Pip and sort of see she's got all of them lined up. It's going to be um, quite quite different. Um, the, the Derwent Valley, um, for me, gets a lot of florals, quite citrus. Um, we've got a very north-facing slope, Dad's Vineyard, so it does get quite ripe, lovely white flowers, um, touch of stone fruit on occasion. Um, Hughes Riesling, uh, the Tamar Valley, uh, is the warmest of the three regions, so a uh, very bold um, citrus profile, um, although Hughes obviously got slightly cooler site um, or picks it to, to really guard that beautiful natural acid that he's got in that wine that gives it a lovely minerality. Um, and down south, uh, Johnny in the Dontracasto Channel, um, his reg or sub region um, is 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 the coolest of the three. So it's going to have really fine, uh, precise characteristics. Um, he's going to have a little bit more of that acid sugar balance play um working for him but um quite a quite a sort of a generous wine um in that he's um there's a little bit more sugar to balance a little bit more acid um and you know lovely bold bold flavors from a little bit more time on the vine great well um uh, Greer, thank you so much for your time uh, stick around. We'll grab you back in a few minutes for a for a Q and A with the audience. And for those people watching, shoot through your questions, and uh, we'll have uh, we'll have Greer along with Hugh and Johnny answering them in just a few minutes' time. See you soon, Greer. So our next wine and our final Riesling for tonight comes from Mewstone, a really exciting label and project down. Uh, in the Don Castro Channel, which is southwest of Hobart. Uh, Johnny Hughes picked up the Best New Act Trophy in our, uh, in our awards uh, in, two years ago. And we'll uh, grab him on the line now to have a chat with him. Johnny, are you there? I am. Can you hear ah, me? Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Greer was saying some really interesting things about the sub-regionality just then, and and I, and and you know one of those was the interplay between um, um, acid and sugar in in the ripening of the grapes. I'll, I'll probably circle back 
to that in a minute. But uh, to begin with, just um, some of your own background with with Riesling. Um, Ten to fifteen years ago, you were working in a in a wine bar, and so really interested to get your take on on how Riesling culture has, has changed. Because when you look at these three wines that, that we've been looking at today, in, in in each of them, it's 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 not pronounced, but there's there's certainly a, a fine el- layer of uh, of or thread of skin contact in, in the in the wine, and that's probably not classically Australian and as well they're just they're slightly off off bone dry yeah I think when I first came back from studying in New Zealand and had done a couple of vintage and lobbed into a bar um, Riesling was one of the wines that you could put on by the glass and a case would get you through a few weeks because it was one of the slowest movers uh, it's been really intriguing to see over the last 10, 15 years, the evolution of Riesling. I think there's more winemakers doing more interesting things with it. And the average person has found the Riesling a bit more accessible, I think, over the last five to 10 years. Um, and I think that's maybe just the generational change. The kids coming through are more than willing to try new things. And Riesling's been a big beneficiary of that for me. Um, the styles have evolved into a much wider array in Australia. Um, I think when I first studied back in New Zealand, I think they probably already had a wider array than we did. The Australian Riesling was was pretty well sorted out in that, that very defined, quite dry um, style. And I think that's really opened up and, and the punters have responded to that and started drinking a little bit more Riesling. And what are you doing with Riesling and how is it translating to, to what we're seeing in the glass in front of us now? Uh, I guess for us, with the Mewstone particularly, um, the the big difference for me was deciding to jump in and doing full wild in barrel with old barrels, but with fairly high solids was probably the other big thing for me that was different to the Rieslings that I'd seen earlier in my career. I hadn't seen a lot of winemakers playing with, with high solids and extended lees contact, so the, the, this Mewstone Riesling sits for about six months in barrel before we bottle it. Um, so again, those, those couple of things for me were were fairly experimental in my own world. I, we'd had a couple of plays in my previous job with this sort of approach, but we hadn't really gone quite to the extent we did in 2016 with Mewstone. Um, and the results were really good. So we just have stuck with that with Mewstone and have been very happy to get a very textural, sort of very flavorful sort of Riesling. Um, with happy to play with a little bit of sugar to balance what is some pretty searing acidity down in uh, the Don Tricasto. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a massive massive fan of this wine. There is just layers and layers of flavour rolling out on it. Uh, it's got you know this gorgeous stone fruits and citrus and and also this really gorgeous sort of spiced apple character. Um, uh, and it's it, you know it's got it's got this textural component. It's completely Moorish because it's just slightly off dry, but it's got a lot of acid too. So it's not it's 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 uh, it's not flabby at all on, on on the palate. It's just it's just so well dialed in. Um, getting into the vineyard and grow, growing grapes. Uh, I'd love to to hear you chat about um, about your your part of Tas- Tasmania, the, the climate there, and, and and what that means when you're ripening grapes on, on the vine and 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 deciding when when you when you pick them and how that might contrast to other regions. So I guess for us down in the the channel, we have. Uh, as Greer mentioned earlier, one of the coolest sort of parts of Tasmania, which obviously makes us one of the coolest regions going around Australia. Um, and for me, that means we can hang our grapes out for longer. Basically, we don't lose acid much at all. So we end up with quite high acids, even at quite high sugars. So the hotter it is, probably the more acid you're going to lose during the growing season. And um, the faster your grapes are going to ripen. So for us, we get a very slow ripening 
So we're picking grapes at the very end of the Australian season. Um, but that hang time allows time for flavour to develop. So we're typically picking something like the Mewstone Riesling at sort of 12 to 12 and a half Bome, which for those out there relates to the amount of sugar, which will convert to alcohol. So if we're picking it at around sort of 12 and a half, you could expect a 12 and a half to 13% alcohol wine. Um, so, which is, which is getting on the riper end of the, the Riesling pick in Australia. Um, but at the same time, because of the cold nature of our vineyard, we've got lots of acid. So for me, that's been one of the reasons that Riesling works on our site is that we can get lots of flavour, but with lots of acid. And that allows me to have a bit more of a play come the end of the ferment and deciding when to stop it with, with what we hope is a nice little bit of balance between the acid and the, the fruit and the sugar. And um, uh, finally, before we jump to the Q and A with the audience, look, looking at this, at looking at this wine, what what do you see in it as as characters that's come from uh, the amount of time that the wine has spent on its solids? Um, that is the those uh, you know the dead yeast lees and the the other grape solids that that will settle at the bottom of a tank or, or barrel. What are, what are those characters within the glass and uh, and and uh, what what are the what are the vineyard or or, or, or great char- great growing characters that you see there? Well, I guess the main for me the main reason that we leave ours on these is to build the I guess the texture of the wine the sort of the little bit of fattiness the little bit of juiciness in the mid palate um, and that just for me helped to extend length and 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 pull that flavour out for a little bit longer. Um, the vineyard is what's giving us the, the the acid profile. And that acid is quite high in this wine, but hides very easily behind the flavor and that texture. Um, and when I say hides, it just sort of tucks in and supports everything else. It's really important to the wine. It's kind of what the wine's built around, but because of that lovely acid, we can build more texture. Um, we, can, we can leave in more flavor. Um, so it's quite unique to grow Riesling in some of these sort of cold sites. And it's, it means for me as a winemaker, I get a little bit more flex in playing with the wine and, and sort of trying to make something that's bigger and bolder and, um, yeah, just easy to drink. Great, love it. Johnny, we're going to go to a Q&A now with the audience and we'll see, uh, we'll see what questions have, uh, have come through from our webpage. Uh, the first one, Greer, is directed to you. Uh, do you think you'll branch out into other varieties down the line? Oh, we're missing some audio, some sound from Greer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, we you... got you. <laughs> um, so I've got yeah. a Pinot that's done very well in the show system. Uh, beautiful Syrah and... Um, I made a vermouth actually that's been um, pretty pretty uh, interesting and received quite well. Um, I used to make a lot of bubbles in my old role, so I am missing that a lot. So hopefully one day soon I can get back to bubbles. Johnny, uh, what's that Donta Castro channel? Dontra Casto. <laughs> Still working on that pronunciation. Uh, channel apart as a Riesling producing region. I think for me, it probably comes mainly down to the the really cool temperatures we get, which means our growing season is exceptionally long. This year, we were picking our Riesling in the first week of May. I think in the end, it's the 1st of May, 2nd of May, we picked the Riesling this year. Um, So that makes it one of the longer longer growing seasons that you'll find. And I think uh, that that's a benefit to a a variety like Riesling, where it just, like we said earlier, allows time for flavour to develop and uh, retains acid really well. So... Yeah, I think it's just the very cool nature of someone like the Don Tricasto. That's how you say it, Rory. Uh, thank you. Greer, are you seeing uh, more barrel fermentation with Riesling in Tassie these days? Um, I'm probably not the right person to ask. I think the boys are doing the barrel fermentation. Um, I'm not doing it on my Riesling, but um, I think it's a pretty exciting thing to pursue. Um, for me personally, I think I've got enough uh, little sort of 
complexity building things happening um, that I'm not not that keen to, to do that but um, yeah definitely I do know of quite a lot of people that are exploring that and really excited with the results. Hugh any plans for your own vineyard? Oh, um, dreaming a long a long time into the future. <laughs> I work with um, three wonderful growers who um, spend a lot of time um, in their vines and I love working with them so uh, that has me set for a while. They produce wonderful fruit and I love keeping that relationship going. Uh, Jonathan, I've, I've often noticed a distinct density to Mewstone wines similar to something I've seen in wines from Omaha in New Zealand. Uh, would this be Tewa or clay? Tewa or clay? Tewa, question mark, clay, question mark. <laughs> Sorry, just, um, I think Tewa would be a big part of it. The, the, the soils and, and the climate and everything absolutely leads to density. We're fairly low yielding fruit. We don't have anywhere near enough in a growing season. We got about six, we got five ton off our two hectares this year. Um, so in terms of we're very low, very low yielding and that that leads to some intensity and some um and to that character i think in the wines and we are on a, a fairly clay driven sort of base as well so maybe it is the clay hugh what's your ideal food match for your delicious racy riesling oh it's got to be roast pork with some crackling on top um i think the style of wine that Johnny's been talking about um, that I love to drink um, with this texture um, matches to so much more than what everyone traditionally would think of as Riesling food. Um, get some meat, get some fat, um, put some star anise if you want to make it a little um, wild, but good Riesling with good texture can go with so many different, different dishes. Pork would be my choice. Hugh, I've got another question for you. What do you think it is that defines Tamar Riesling? I think it's the relative warmth um, and the depth of the citrus characters you can get. Um, I think all this talk of super cold and slightly warmer regions, everyone needs to remember that Tasmania as a whole is much colder than just about everywhere except probably one vineyard on the mainland. Um, so they're minute differences, but in somewhere that has such a long growing season, it makes a huge difference. And finally, Hugh, can you tell us what inspired your label? And what got you, what wine got you into winemaking? Uh, inspired the label was my, um, I was working in a bar um, to pay my way through a history degree. So Wellington and Wolf are um, two historical figures that I studied and it, it, it rolled off rolled off the tongue quite well one morning when I had to finally give it a, give it a name. Um, and the wine, if anyone wants to seek it out, is a Schloss Johannesburger, which is a Rheingau Riesling from, the, from Germany. Uh, absolutely fantastic, bone dry, um, and will last for years. And Greer, someone wants to know what got you into winemaking? Well, I grew up pruning vines and I thought it must be more fun in the winery. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> and I wasn't uh, wrong. Well, with it's that, very fun. <laughs> with that, well, it's certainly fun uh, to taste and enjoy your products, Greer and Hugh. Thanks. And Jonathan Hughes. Thank you very much for joining us this evening from Tamar to the Derwent to the Dontracasto channel. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Rory. Have a good evening. Cheers. Thank you, Rory. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So with that, we're on to our next wine, uh, which is coming from Small Island. Uh, and uh, it's their Chardonnay, the 2019 Chardonnay from Saltwater River. And to tell us all about where the hell is Saltwater River is James Browinski, the winemaker. Good day, Rory. Hey, how are you? Good, mate. How are you? Uh, well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Love the Hawaiian shirt. 
Uh, you Barney said dress down up. There you right now, no <laughs> doubt. Just for you, just for you, Rory. <laughs> uh, okay, so tell us, uh, what is this Saltwater River? So Saltwater River is a new site that I came across, which is right down the Tasman Peninsula. Uh, it's sort of down towards Port Arthur, uh, sort of east of Hobart, I guess. It's sort of out by itself. Um, amazing guys growing the grapes down there and the fruit just looks incredible. It is quite young, but far out it's got some potential. I'm really excited about the site. So good things to come, I reckon. And so I understand you're now um, taking all of the fruit from the site and you've, you've, there, there's, there's other varieties beyond Chardonnay growing there. There is. We've got a tiny bit of Gamay, which is really exciting, uh, an amazing Pinot coming across, a little bit of Pinot Gris, and we've got about three or four more hectares to plant out. So open to suggestions as well. Um, to me, one of the tremendously unique things about this wine is that uh, there's no influence of oak whatsoever. I mean, many Chardonnay producers will make wine that that doesn't necessarily have an oak flavour or, or oak ca characters within the wine, but they might mature the, the wines in, in old oak barrels so the the flavour as such isn't isn't being imparted into into the wine. But this wine, you've made it without, without any oak maturation whatsoever, new or old? No, no oak at all. Uh, it was my first real vintage working with this fruit and I really wanted to see what it could do just by itself. Um, I wanted to show off the site. Uh, I wanted to go and explore that really clean acid and go more on that sort of Chablis style, I guess. But uh, nothing wrong with oak chardonnays at all, but this is a bit of a sort of O to a purity, I guess. Uh, this is a gorgeous wine. There's a lot of uh, green a apple ca characters uh, going on within the wine. What, what's, what have you done from a winemaking perspective? Uh, so we've kept it fairly simple. Uh, it was a whole bunch pressed straight to tank. Uh, it was racked off its very heavy solids and then left to age on its lee solid for quite a long time. Uh, it is not all the way through mallow. We have a lactic fermentation, which takes that uh, malic acid or the green apple acid and then converts it into a softer acid like lactic acid, which is your more milk style acids, but keeps a bit of pep in it. Um, I really wanted to make a Chardonnay that would pair very well with the local food, especially the oysters and the crayfish and the white sort of seafood and give it a bit of zip through that. So. Uh, yeah, mostly wild ferment as well. Uh, and uh, w there's this there's this interesting uh, character in this wine, which is a bit briny, a bit a bit uh, a bit saline. Do, do do you think this comes from all the the uh, salt in the in the sea air from the from the from the you know, bodies of ocean water well, you're surrounded by there? Super interesting question, that one. I really like that flavour in the Chardonnay. I love it in all Chardonnays uh, when I get that saline, sort of it hits the side of your palate and really brings it outwards. To be honest, I, I don't know where that comes from, whether it comes from the fermentation, the fruit itself, or that maritime salt influence. But I really enjoy that flavour, but I'm not sure where it comes from. So. Okay. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to grab you back on in a few minutes' time for some Q&A with the audience. Um, and so stick around for that. And to awesome, the people... Mate. Thank uh, you. What, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. To the people uh, watching right now, please, by all means, uh, any questions for James or any of the winemakers tonight, uh, uh, just pop them in beneath the, uh, the video window and, uh, and we'll, we'll grab those and put them forward to the winemakers. So our next one, and uh, we're up to Pinot. Hallelujah. 
uh, all the wines have been fantastic um, and you can't pick between, you can't name your favourite charm, but, I mean, really, truly, if it had to be one wine on a desert or deserted island for the rest of the life, it, it would probably be Pinot, wouldn't it? Um, this is from Sailor Seeks Horse, which is a really, really exciting project by Gillian Paul Litskin. We'll get them uh, online right now and uh, and have a chat to them about what they're doing here. Hello, Gillian Paul. How are you? Hello. Hello, Rory. How are you? You well? <laughs> good, yes, good to see you. Um, God, if we look super so, close. Yeah, I'm going to sit good. back a bit. Jeez. <laughs> Well, you, you two are just inseparable, aren't you? <laughs> uh, it would appear so, yeah. yes. <laughs> or too tight to get two sets of headphones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the so the Sailor Seeks Horse project. You uh, you you had been you you'd come down to Tasmania via uh, as as Margaret River winemakers who are also travelling around the world. Uh, in doing various vintages, Absolutely. I understand what 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 led Perhaps you to seek out. Perhaps a bit glorified, say we're winemakers. <laughs> <laughs> Sell our hands. <laughs> okay. Um, so what what brought you down to Tasmania to the to seeking out such a marginal location as as southern Tasmania? Um, well, I, I guess. Uh, we started in wine, living and working in London, doing something completely different. And, uh, and, you know, I think we were enjoying our lives, but we felt that there was something missing. So we wanted to get into something we were really passionate about. And wine was, um, you know, I guess an option. So we went down to the south of France and worked a harvest there and loved it, realised there was a lot of hard work, realised we knew nothing about making wine or growing grapes. And so we went, came back to Australia went to uni in Margaret River uh, on our sort of drive back, I guess, from France to London, we talked about doing Pinot because that was really what we wanted to do. And we felt that if we wanted to do Pinot, um, the place to do it was Tasmania, really. And so I guess our, our whole kind of from that first harvest, it was about getting to a point where we could have our own vineyard in Tasmania grow our own grapes, make our own wine and put the wine on out, out and sell it, I guess, ourselves. And so it was going back to uni, studying viticulture and winemaking, getting experience uh, of a whole year of, of, well, of sort of throughout the whole years through vineyards and wineries, you know, driving tractors and changing wheels on tractors as well as understanding how grapevines grow and how to, and, you know, how to manage that. Uh, and then eventually we got our way uh, to Tasmania. And the Huon was uh, a place that we figured was where we wanted to be. You can probably talk a bit more about why. Yeah, I guess we sort of um, changing, you know, I was basically 30 when I, when I sort of had my um, third life crisis, I guess, and sort of went, right, what do I want to do? And, um, and, and, and winemaking was kind of, uh, well, being a vigneron was, uh, was what we wanted to do. And, um, you know, you sort of, if you're going to change things up and do something different and, you know, <laughs> move to the other side of the world, uh, you basically want to do something that's quite challenging. And um, I think, you know, growing and making Pinot you know, Noir is, a, is, is you know, an incredibly challenging task. It's quite a capricious grape um, along with Nebbiolo. Um, you know, you've really got to pick the right site and, uh, and the right region. Um, and so, you know, we'd... And with the idea of it being, you know, a really hard thing, what else is quite hard? Because we had, you know, reasonable options in terms of, you know, maybe doing New Zealand, maybe doing Oregon, in France, whatever. It was sort of, you know, the the, the, the world sort of, you know, sat out there waiting. And um, and we thought, actually, what's really quite challenging is making great Australian Pinot Noir. Um, I don't mean to be sort of disparaging about the Australian Pinot Noir scene, but certainly it is... Um, it's not had quite the same focus. Certainly 15 years ago, it didn't have the same focus as, say, perhaps the um uh the rest of the world did and um and i think we saw that as quite a big challenge so it was like how do we uh, how do we how do we find somewhere to make great uh, great pinot noir and obviously being you know relatively impoverished it sort of needed to be somewhere that was up and coming uh and right on the edge viticulturally in terms of climate and um and uh, the huon valley sort of tick, ticked all the boxes and um you know i think even 
even when we moved to Tasmania in 2010, there was a little bit of sort of like, oh no, you can't grow, you know, table pinot down in the human. Don't be ridiculous. It's only good for sparkling. So it was, um, you know, it, it definitely felt like a big challenge. And, um, and I think when you move to uh, established wine regions, uh, you have a support structure as well uh, behind you. So, you know, there, you can always um, do uh, get somebody in to do something. But we felt sort of down here, it was a little out of the way uh, and that we didn't necessarily have that. Uh, and that, that made it more exciting. And, um, and so everything that we did was about, no, it was having that end goal in mind uh, and making sure we had all the, um, all the, um, uh, so I've just read that. This, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so it's uh, so you know it's it's about um, uh, yeah just having that support structure, uh, so and uh, or not having it in fact, and um, and having the skill set to be able to actually um, achieve what you want to be able to achieve in a in a, a new sort of upcoming area. Now you were ridiculously self-deprecating before when you referred to yourselves <laughs> as seller hands because it was not long after. <laughs> migrating to Tasmania, you, you took on uh, winemaking duties at Home Hill and you picked up Australia's most prestigious, arguably Australia's most prestigious wine trophy for a red wine, the Jimmy Watson, which is somewhat unheard of, a, a, Pinot, a Pinot and a Pinot from Tassie taking out an award that historically has been won by South Australian Big Reds. Was yours the first or, ever? Or a Tasmanian Pinot Shiraz. <laughs> no, it was the second Pinot and the second Tasmanian wine, uh, but the first Tasmanian Pinot. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And I think. You well, know, it was the first. We, yeah. It was a yeah. first. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I think, yeah, we get the winemaking credit, but um, really that, that vineyard's a pretty outstanding vineyard. And they'd made great wines before we came on. and you know, they'll continue to make great wines. Um, we just, it was a, a good year and a good site and it was and a get, good time. And you get lucky. And you get lucky, yeah. With any show right. system, there's, yeah. a, there's an element of luck there too. So, yeah. Uh, so exciting. Home Hill <laughs> is, is another vineyard within Huon. How would, how do you describe, but the, but the wine is, the, the, those Home Hill wines are quite different to your own. Uh, are those yeah. are those differences um, vineyard differences, or are they winemaking differences, or a combination of both? Uh, it's a it's a it's a bit of both. I think it's really led by the vineyard differences. Um, the our site is uh, hungrier soils. It's a cooler site. It's lower yielding. Um, Home Hill is a in a little kind of sun trap within the Huon, which is a very cool area. Um, and so you and, and I guess a more vigorous sort of a site, higher yields, but really good concentration as well. Um, and I think, you know, stylistically, yes, there are differences to the wine. You sort of have to guide the wine that you, from the fruit that you see. But um, and so it's, it's mostly vineyard, but there are definitely differences in the, in the winemaking, too. Um, I think without without wanting to get into clonal differences and all that kind of stuff, yeah. there's certainly that component <laughs> to it. But I think. I think with uh, with um, I, I think our approach to sort of winemaking is to um, is to guide is to look at the vineyard and, and basically kind of interpret the fruit. Try not to force your personality. I guess you know. I think uh, we remember um, we remember seeing a guy called Jim Clendenin from um, from a winery called uh, Aubon Clamart over in uh, over in the Napa. And anyway, it was a couple of years ago at the International Pinot Noir celebration, and he. He talked about uh, finding the right site for what you want to make, um, rather than taking a site and then going, "Well, I want a you know certain style of wine," and trying to force it uh, into that uh, to that zone. So, um, so I think that's what you know with Home Hill, it, it, it naturally just wants to make a slightly uh, more fruit forward sort of style. Um, and I think with our with our site, um, certainly there's a little bit more of a, a savoury sort of edge to to the wine. So, um, and I think you just, um, yeah, you don't just. I mean, for us, it's it's about guiding it, not about um, not about putting. Cream. And and this wine, what what one of the things I I love so so much about this wine is those autumnal 
undergrowth sort of characters that, that are coming through in, in, in this wine is, um, uh, is, is that a vintage, is that a vintage thing or are you, are you seeing those sort of characters every year? Um, I, I think that's pretty typical of our wines, actually. In fact, I think that 2018 almost says a little less of that than our other wines. Um, yep. It was a, a warmer year, so I think that 18 is um, is a little bit um, fuller body, a little bit richer, a little bit more fruity than, say, some of our other wines in previous years that have, have been a bit cooler in those years. So I think that's um, that's a common thread for our wines. We seem to get that off the site, and I think that's kind of enhanced with wild ferments and um, the wine spends a full 12 months in oak, so we empty as we're filling the next year, um, then stands a bit of time in tank, so a couple of months in stainless steel tank just to come around before it gets bottled. So, you know, we, we harvest in usually around April and then we'll end up bottling the year after but in, in August. So it spends a long time to do, doing that. But I think mostly it's, it's about the vineyard and the fruit. We see that in the fruit already. So Yeah, and potentially there is, um, there is again, without going to clones, uh, that, yeah. but I will. Uh, so there, uh, there is one particular clone that has quite a, it's quite a savoury sort of edge to that, uh, to that particular clone, and it probably makes up about 50% of, um, uh, of the planting. So it, um, I think that definitely comes through. I mean, I think if we had um, other clones on that site, then perhaps that, um, uh, perhaps it would go in a slightly different direction. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, that definitely is a component of it, but you know, it's, a, it's still a, it's a young vineyard. Um, it's only, well, I mean, what fifty percent of it say is um, is fifteen years old, and the, and the rest is ten uh, percent, uh, uh, ten years old. So it's sort of you know, it's still in that zone of you know, once you get fifteen and then twenty and stuff, or um, perhaps start to see um, slight differences. But um, but I think one of the other things that we see in the wines uh, that's more of a consistent thread and. Historically, we've talked a lot about um, acidity, um, but I think uh, it's actually the, the fine uh, but dense and persistent sort of tannin structure. So I think that's always the, uh, we've got that sort of savory edge, but also um, also those tan that tannin depth and density, because the wines can look certainly in glass. I mean, we're not, we're not really very hung up on color. Um, and, um, and so, you know, you can look at them and they're, they're pretty transparent. And, uh, uh, and I think people are always quite surprised at the depth of flavor and the depth of tannin and that persistence that, uh, that comes through. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and about the vineyard, it's holly, pinot and chardonnay at this stage. Uh, are there plant plans for any plantings of other varieties into the future? Well, 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 I mean, so we um, we have planted some trousseau, so um, uh, that's uh, that should be um, interesting. Um, and then uh, we did have uh, great plans for uh, some Clusard or Poussard, which is uh, another Jura variety, so red wine, um, and um, but not available in Australia. And um, the people who <laughs> uh, we were getting it through, uh, we just had a conversation with, and um, the person who had organised it has left the company. And uh, the um, now the new person's like, I've got no record of this particular <laughs> thing. And because it's such a long-term process, like it's like a seven-year process before you can actually get the uh, the vines. Uh, you know, that's um, so we're now a, a couple of years behind on that. Uh, so I think we might just flip that Check over to. Um, <laughs> You know, we're thinking about maybe maybe Aligote or maybe Savignon or something like that. So, um, yeah, but it's something it's not it's not for it. Yeah, just a little thing to play with. And you know, it is such a long term thing. You know, we started thinking, oh, we better plant some more Pinot and Chardonnay. And then you get to that point where you're like, wait a minute, it's going to be seven or eight years before we actually get a wine out of this. Um, we might get built by then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, need to get on with it. All right, guys. I've got. Uh, let's let's do some audience Q and A. We'll get James back on the line. And uh, hello, and... James. Hello, guys. How are you? Hello. Uh, oh, we have to squeeze right. up. Yeah. <laughs> James, yeah. Is, James, is <laughs> you have to get even closer, you two. Uh, <laughs> yes. and Paul. Not... Sailor Six yeah. Horse is an evocative name. What's the story behind it? Oh, good. Here we go. <laughs> Well done, Gil. Okay. Uh, yes. Well, if we name a wine like that, then you've got to answer these questions. Yep. Um, 
so it's a tricky thing. I think, you know, we'd bought this vineyard, we were resurrecting it, we'd, uh, we'd made wine and it's sort of been five years from when we bought the vineyard to having to put a label on a wine. And over that whole time, we were trying to figure out what name to use. And, you know, surname of Lipscomb isn't that great. And the vineyard's on a, in a place called Craddock, which is not great. And, you know, it's on a sand hill and it's not great. And so there's a lot of names that didn't really work. And uh, when we, the first year that we bought, we were pruning the vineyard. We went into a local cafe in Signet called the Red Velvet Lounge. And they used to have a community notice board uh, with handwritten signs pinned up there. And there was a sign that said, Sailor Seeks Horse. And we kind of looked a little bit more closely. It was a pretty catching kind of a title for a random <laughs> sign. And, uh, and underneath was a paragraph that said, you know, the guy had circumnavigated the world solo. He'd gone from east coast to west coast of the US on a mule and then back again. And he just turned up in Signet, Tasmania, a little town, looking for a horse or pony to travel around Tasmania on. So could anyone give him a hand and, and get a, give him a horse or a pony? And so we kind of thought, you know, this guy's one is mad, is a little bit crazy. But also I think there was a synergy that we felt um, with that idea with the, you know, just because you say that doesn't mean you can't jump on a horse and do something different. You know, we were living and working in London at desk jobs and we decided to have a vineyard in Tasmania. Um, so it was, you know, don't get pigeonholed uh, in life and yeah, try something different, try something new. Yep. yep. Uh, great. Uh... Next question, James. I heard you say <laughs> that to work you on that. your show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I heard you Thank say you that you want your Chardonnay to be Chablis esque. What does that mean? Uh, well, I guess I, I just really, I, I became a big fan of a lot of the wines of Chablis and promoting that acid line and that crisp minerality and I guess that was a style that I had in mind whilst going about making this. General question, is anyone using smoke tainted grapes to do anything interesting? <laughs> uh, make spirits? <laughs> <laughs> we had, um, we, I mean we had that issue last year uh, with the Hewer and there were lots of bushfires so we couldn't harvest anything from our own vineyard at all. Uh, hugely smoke tainted and uh, had that really difficult decision of do, what do we do about that. Um, we, we ended up making the decision to leave that fruit for the birds and to buy other people's fruit from the north of the state and make a little bit of wine for ourselves under a, a different label but you know that we'll release later on in that interim time. But we did have to deal with it for High and Hill as well uh, and they had less exposure to smoke so uh, less of that issue with smoke taint. We did lots of trials. We made a very um, light blush rosé which was really made by a whole bunch pressing the grapes so the smoke compounds sit in the skins of the grapes. If you squeeze the juice out really gently then you don't extract so much of those smoke compounds um, and we managed to get away with a, you know, a little bit of that uh, and, and as a way of telling a story about putting a product out there uh, that, you know, gives mm. a story of the vintage, really. Um, I know, yeah. Um, but, and then the rest of it, any, any Pinot, any of the hard pressings, we did do distillation with because you can get a pretty good product from distilling smoke grape, smoke yeah. grapes. <laughs> so, yeah. But other than that, I don't know. Any ideas? Please let us know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worried it might happen again. <laughs> um, Gillian Paul, how do uh, Pinot wines di of Huon differ to other Tasmanian regions? I, th I think we I, I sort of broached that slightly earlier. I think when you look at uh, guys like Home Hill and, um, and us and the Chateau wines, um, sort of you do see a fineness of tannin more than probably anything that's probably the and that that's that savory component i think is 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 a is a, it's a bit of a thread and maybe not so much with home hill um but i think the fineness of the tannins and the density of the tannins i think that's probably the the main thing um you have a cooler feel to the wines as well so you know it is obviously quite a bit um Cooler. Sorry, I've got six year five year old in the background. <laughs> Sorry about anyway, that. Anyway, uh, but um, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, so so we have that coolness of um, the uh, the fruit as well. So I think 
um, and, and just not quite so fruit forward. But when um, we say that, but I mean, you look at you look at Home Hills wines, and they are obviously a lot more fruit forward. And um, and I think um, th that's where you get into that thing of going. Well, there are regional differences, there are soil differences, but quite often, I mean, it does come down to personalities. And I think you know something something like Home Hill, where um, it, it's also how you manage the vineyard. So all those decisions that you make in terms of in terms of the vineyard, the spacing of the of the vines, the uh, the you know how you prune it, etc. All those things then move towards you know the particular style of wine that you that you want to make. So um, so I think if you if you're looking for a certain style of wine potentially then i think you can you, you it's probably better to go with producer rather than region um but there there are overarching sort of themes that, that you can get so yeah james how important is row orientation and wind direction on the impact of growing pinot in cool climate areas what is the most ideal setting if you could have one uh, oh, it's, there's quite a few questions in that. Um, look, <laughs> row orientation. Look, your, your sites, one site from another site, and also touching on what um, Paul was just saying as well, one site from another site can be very different, even if they're next door. Uh, you can have, we've got more soil types in Tasmania than any other state in Australia. Uh, we've got different aspects. Uh, so, row orientation you really want to make the most of you know your sun exposure but one really important thing for us down at well down at saltwater river especially is the impact of wind uh especially during flowering uh we had very very low yields this year because we just get smashed by wind and terrible um terrible flowering because of that um wind it, it, we're looking at putting up some wind blocks uh, at doing a few other things. It's a, it's a hard thing, but it really the answer is you've really got to know your site and how to manage your site. And there's no hard or fast rule from your site compared to your neighbours, I guess. But yeah, <laughs> so a bit going on there. So thank thank you, James. Yeah, Gillian Paul, how's the trousseau tracking? The person writes here that you had told them about it at Dark Mofo last year. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not. I'm not very good at growing new vines, so they're not going that well. We, we'd um, we'd been warned that uh, they um, that they were super vigorous, and uh, and so we decided to plant them on. Like, like grass doesn't even grow on this part of the hill and we thought it'd be a natural balance but I think it skewed it slightly in favour of low vigour uh, so I think we kind of um, might need to give them a little bit of encouragement this year um, so yeah, yeah. I, I would say uh, we don't really plump up the, the new plantings no, very much maybe, they, are, maybe, they are made to look after themselves a little bit yeah we might see no. a wine in 2027 I suppose yeah. that's about when, um, <laughs> for now <laughs> that's for now that's that's probably about right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, James, how is the gamay going down there? Uh, you have uh, what have you learnt about this variety since making it? I absolutely love the gamay that I'm getting out of Saltwater River. Uh, I think it's stunning. It's a lot of fun to work with, uh, and it makes a really, really fun wine. And um, I've learnt that. Uh, I'm best off just keeping it fairly simple uh, and letting the fruit speak for itself. Um, how's it going? We've, we've had a pretty hard year. There's only about 600 litres of it this year, so it's not going to be a big uh, release. But uh, we're looking at planting some more and, you know, I, I really like it. I really enjoy it. So hopefully in the future we'll see a bit more volume. And James, this may be the final question. Uh, what does the future hold for Small Island Wines? Uh, well, we're in the process in, of uh, reducing the amount of sites that we're buying from or, and growing with, uh, and we're just focusing on our Saltwater River site and our northern site in Gary. And it's about refining, and it's about really getting to know those vineyards from now on and getting to know the fruit 
from year to year to year and slowly trying to increase the uh the the quality i guess that's that is my goal refine james gilly and paul that was the final question so thank you so much for joining stick around and keep doing what you do guys so up next we're still in tasmania and we're still with pino well we're with pino for the rest of the event and this one is from Two Ton Tasmania, Ricky Evans, TMV 2019, Pinot Noir. Ricky, are you there? Yes, you are. How are you, Ricky? Hey, mate. How are you going? Well, thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much for joining us. You've been a busy boy, as I, as I understand it. Vintage uh, has been a late one for you, and you've been working on a new wine bar slash cellar door slash retail outlet slash something else. Uh, yep, that's correct. Yeah, we had a pretty late vintage. Everything was pretty slow down here. Um, yeah, obviously in the midst of uh, coronavirus, we've, uh, I mean, we were halfway through fitting out a nice new space in Launceston, um, just down the street middle of town um so yeah we're, we're working on a little wine bar slash wine store um, that'll become a tasting room for two ton tasmania as well so it's pretty exciting so let's get on to this wine uh, <coughs> what is uh, you, you make a few p pinots and indeed some people may, may see you to be pinot focused what's what's the concept of your tmv pinot uh, well, TMV, it's really a, a cross-section of the whole Tamar Valley. So I guess um, like a lot of regions, sites are very diverse. So I've collected, I suppose, vineyards that are uh, that spread from back behind Launceston all the way up the Tamar. So we've got sites that are close to the ocean and then all the way back that are more influenced by the mountains essentially. So uh, basically I'm trying to create a wine there that covers the whole valley and speaks of the whole valley and gives us a representation of that every year. And talking about the Tamar Valley, how does it uh, differ itself in Pinot compared to other subregions of Tasmania? <clears throat> uh, I think, I mean, Paul and Gilly touched on it. Like the, the Huon is has these beautiful savory elements and they have this really fine tannin. And maybe the Tamer is, you know, the other end of that where we're really bright and we're very varietal. If you're picking on the earlier side, you're getting real red fruit spectrum. Um, you do get a density of tannin, but it's probably a more tactile kind of sensation that you get on the on the back palate. But yeah, I guess these wines are really the way I want to see them. Uh, they're, they're bright and they're fresh and they're 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 lifted and they're 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 pretty wines, but they have depth of flavour and they have length as well. And on the on the winemaking front, uh, to me the your TMV <coughs> Pinots <coughs> seem to be quite a stylistic interpretation of Pinot where they are lighter, they are brighter, they're very much in the in the red fruits spectrum. They've got some carbonic characters coming through and you, and you don't see uh, much interplay with, with oak in them. What, what, what are you doing with the winemaking? Um, our TMV is pretty simple. I think we have a density of flavour up here that um, <clears throat> that warrants using a bit of whole bunch. So um, I'm using a little bit of whole bunch in all ferments. Basically, that's my zero, my starting point. So I'm trying to dial them back. Um, I want them to be fresh and light and vibrant. Um, I guess we get in saying that it's probably a relative kind of lightness compared to other wines in the tamer. I want them to be on the lighter side, but there's definitely heavier examples um but that's where that's where i'm that's where i'm chasing 
And you just mentioned a bit of a, a, a technical <clears throat> term, whole bunch. I don't think we've touched on that this evening. Do you want to just uh, give us a, a, a brief definition of what we talk about when with whole bunch fermentation? Um, well, it's just including the whole clusters in the ferment as you would see them. You pick them and that's how they are, as opposed to destemming and taking away the the fruit from the stems. So I guess um, I'm, or everyone who is using whole bunch is introducing a savoury element to the wine. And I guess I'm looking to see a, a, a whole range of colours, if you will. So maybe you've got your red and into blue and maybe a little black, black fruit, but I want to see a little bit of green, which is kind of that savouriness and that freshness that, that, that you'll see in Pinot Noir and Pip mentioned it earlier. If you see good Pinots, they'll have this this fan of, of flavour and and um, and a spectrum that covers a wide range and that's what we're chasing by using Whole Bunch. Ricky, thank you so much. Stick around. We'll get you back on for our Q&A panel with, our, uh, with questions that are coming through from the audience in, in in a few moments time. And now we'll get on to our next one, which is uh, coming from DCB in the Yarra Valley, made by Chris Bendel. And we'll get uh, Chris on the line to have a chat. This is uh, Chris's 100% whole bunch. G'day, Chris, how are you? G'day, Rory. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so you're another producer that we that we might uh, label as as a, a Pinot file. How many Pinots do you have in the lineup? At the moment, I have four in the lineup. And uh, and what are each of they? So I have a um, Yarra blend, which comes from a couple of different sites in the Yarra. A uh, single vineyard Yarra from a specific site in Wurri 100% whole bunch Pinot, and a little foray down into Mornington, uh, which I did for the first time in 2018. So you're making wines from a number of different sites in the, in the Yarra Valley and down in Mornington. What's your experience with regional differences or vineyard differences there? Well, I've been in the Yarra for some years now, for 10 straight years, I think, and um, I really, really enjoy Yarra Pinot, always have, uh, but it was an opportunity to sort of experiment and move beyond the Yarra and try something a little bit different, which led me down to Mornington, and I was fortunate enough to find some 25-year-old vines down there with a little bit of fruit for sale, but um, uh, I've always loved the fragrance and delicacy of the upper Yarra Pinots, whereas the Mornington Pinots for me just seem to have a little bit more muscle, a little bit more power behind them. Um, that's probably one of the major differences that I see. But it's hard to split because both Mornington and Yarra are quite large regions still and have quite variation across the regions. And this 100% whole bunch that we're looking at, where in the Yarra has it come from? So that comes from a vineyard in Wurialik in the um, southernmost part of the Yarra, right up in the hills there in the top of the Yarra Ranges. It's on um, the red soil on a vineyard that's a, from a vineyard that's about 20 years old. And this is 100% whole bunch. And we just uh, started to chat about whole bunch with Ricky previously. Tell us about whole bunch winemaking and 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 why you decided to, to ferment your entire uh, grape harvest for, for this cuvee with, with whole bunches of undestemmed fruit. So this is a wine that was born from my idea that 100% uh, whole bunch ferments are less noticeable than ferments that have a portion of whole bunch fruit uh, and a portion of destemmed fruit. I actually think that they blend, it's less noticeable if it's 100% as a characteristic. So I tried this experiment um, where you take a patch of fruit from a particular vineyard 
and you 100% whole bunch ferment a portion of it and you 100% destem a portion of it and then it gives you the option to blend back later and get your percentages correct because I find it really difficult sometimes. It depends on the year and in the heat of vintage. It's hard to judge what percentages you should or shouldn't incorporate. Um, whereas doing it in that manner, you've always had the opportunity of back blending later on. But this 2018 was the first time that I probably saw well, the most lignified stalks I've ever seen from the Yarra. Um, and I thought it was an opportunity. I made it separately as I had done, but this wine from the start looked good and continued to look good. And so I made the decision to bottle it separately. Uh, really happy with the way it came out. It's a little bit different, a little bit interesting, probably a little bit of a step outside my normal style. So you, you mentioned those stemmed uh, one whole bunch. Could you chat us through the the what you saw as the differences between between those two when they got to the stage where you you know, may or may not consider blending them? Yeah, so the one hundred percent whole bunch has probably the, it helps to lift the nose and it adds a savoury character to the palate. But for me, it's there's really fine silky tannins, uh, whereas the destemmed. Uh, Pinot bunches can add more structure and more tannin, and I do tend to work them a bit harder. Whereas the whole bunch wines, really, um, with that wine, it was only Pigeage, it was only foot stomping. The only um, thing I did to that wine was jump into it at the end of the day and walk around on it with a beer in my hand. Uh, it's fairly basic wine making. But in terms of the separate components, I've always thought that, yeah, it's that fine tannin, that graphite pencil shaving um, and characteristics that I really enjoy in the whole bunch of Pinot and that's what stood out to me mainly is the difference. To me this wine is uh, an really pleasurable, it's fun, it's it's hedonistic, it's it's full of, it's so easy to drink and it, and it immediately grabs you with these really bright red fruit uh, aromas and flavours and it's also got uh, these really gorgeous carbonic characters that have, have come have come from the those whole bunch or, or, or whole or, or fermentation with it within whole berry could you describe and and explain for us you know what what we're talking about when uh, when wines are made in with that sort of carbonic method so in this case the grapes came into the winery and um, it was a fairly cool day when we picked them, fortunately, for 2018. And so all I did was tip it into a standalone fermenter and cover it up. And the carbonic maceration component of that is that the yeast on the surface of the grapes starts to work away and slowly produce a little bit of CO2. And the juice starts to ferment inside the berry, carbonic maceration. And um, I basically left it alone for, I can't remember, it was a few days before I lifted the cover off and then I just proceeded to foot stomp a portion of the ferment each day working my way around until the whole lot had been um, squashed open. So you end up with that blend of carbonic and traditional maceration. Um, but that, that in a lot of ways is what helps to lift the nose and produce those bright red fruits that I think are characteristic of this wine. It's, you're right though Rory, it's just an enjoyable drink. And one of the one of the other characteristics of this wine is that it's so light in colour. Was was that something that you was that an intention that you had in your mind uh, from 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 the outset? Not at all. That's just a, a happy byproduct of um, the whole bunch ferment, which just meant basically less skin contact, which meant a little less colour extraction, which is what I want. Uh, for this wine, which I um, have found that in previous years as well, a whole bunch of fermentation generally extracts less colour and keeps that beautiful bright red colour through the wine. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for, for jumping on to join us. We're going to come back to you in, in a few, few minutes, but I really love the direction, the style and, and uh, of, of this wine. It's so fun and playful and immensely enjoyable. Um, Look forward to uh, to chatting you in it to in a few minutes again. So, from Yarra Valley, we've come from Ta Tasmania into Victoria into Yarra Valley, and now we're into Mornington Peninsula with 
Matara Wines, made by Matthew Campbell, Matthew and Tara Campbell. And this is the label. It's an exciting side project of these two. And at 25 bucks, it's just phenomenal value. And tonight we've got Tara Campbell, half of the dynamic Jura, half of Matara. Tara, we've got Tara from Matara joining <laughs> us. Tara. Thank Hi, you. how are you going? Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, Pinot Noir. Burgundy yeah. is the home of Pinot Noir. I understand Matt's done some uh, vintage work there. What 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 ideas has he brought back home with him? Yeah, lots of ideas, especially for this Pinot, just in terms of the way we look at the wine and the way that we craft it in the winery. Uh, specifically, some of the different things that we look at now that he's done the vintages in Burgundy is just the way the tannins sort of developed. Uh, one of the things that we did in this wine is we did a cold soak pre-ferment, which is where we sort of chill the grapes down and we put them in the tank to sit with the juice for a few days before ferment kicks off. And that allows for really nice colour and tannin extraction. So, yeah. And how is it $25 from the Mornington Peninsula? You make a Pinot Noir of such outstanding value. Uh, well, we're lucky. We we buy fruit from different vineyards and so we source different fruit from around the Mornington Peninsula each year and also from different parts of Victoria. And I guess it's Matt and I doing it all ourselves and over the years we've bought different bits of equipment to use. We make super small quantities and we just try and keep our production costs as low as possible so that we can make the wines super affordable as well. Uh, for example, the Grampian Shiraz, which we just bottled, it was all hands on deck. It was me, Matt and the kids uh, bottling at the winery and filling all the bottles and putting the corks in and even doing the waxing ourselves. So, yeah, it's what we enjoy and it's a real sort of family-run business. And that's what you have kids for, isn't it? That free labour. <laughs> we're getting them in early. <laughs> so we're on the Mornington Peninsula. Are you sourcing the fruit from for this for this uh, this wine? Yeah. So we work with a few different vineyards, but for this one, it was from a vineyard just near Balnarring. So that's on the western port side of Mornington Peninsula. Um, so it's got a nice coastal influence, which allows for a long, slow ripening. Um, this Pinot, we actually picked it at 12.4 Beaume, which is a little bit lower than a lot of people pick their Pinot. But I think it had a really nice fruit ripeness without having too high the an alcohol, potential alcohol to it. So, yeah, it's got that really nice sort of red cherry, berries, sweeter spices to the fruit. And we just like to sort of accentuate that in the winery and bring that forward so that's what you can actually taste in the glass. Um, in the winery, we did a small per portion of whole bunch fermentation, like some of the other winemakers. We like, we think that that adds a nice savoury backbone to it. It lengthens the tannins and it balances out those primary fruit flavours. And then we do secondary fermentation and, and the maturation in older French oak barrels for sort of seven to eight months and bottle it up while it's still super fresh, unfined and unfiltered. So you've got two winemakers under the one banner. Do you guys have any ever have any creative differences? Always. <laughs> With any creative partnership, that's always going to happen. Uh, they're passionate discussions. Uh, we didn't have too many <laughs> on this Pinot, which is good, uh, but certainly we did a collaboration with the boys at Hampton Wine Co on a Mornington Peninsula Chardonnay, and we had a lot of passionate roundtable discussions about picking dates and percentage of malolactic fermentation, and unfortunately I feel like I lost a few of those battles. <laughs> Um, all right, Tara, we're going to jump into our Q&A now, so we'll get uh, our other Pinot makers back on the line, Ricky from Tamar and Chris from the Yarra Valley. Uh, gentlemen, first question goes to uh, Tara. Do you have a plan, a plan in case Phylloxera hits Mornington? Ooh, 
Uh, not at this stage. I mean, we're pretty lucky. We don't sort of own any vineyards at the moment. We'd love to sort of do that down the track, but I doubt we'll be able to afford to do that on the Mornington Peninsula. We might have to sort of look further afield and somewhere else in Victoria. Um, but certainly, you know, they've set up different um, different rules and regulations in place to try and avoid phylloxera and different diseases coming into the Mornington Peninsula region. Um, and so I think, you know, for us, like a lot of different regions, it's really just uh, making sure that everyone does their best to avoid, avoid it coming. Uh, next question for Chris. Chris, this is, this is my own question. What's your beer of choice there? Uh, look, I'm a massive fan of a local brewery called Hargraves Hill. Uh, Solomon is, is, is that um, the can that you just had brewer. there? Uh, this is another one um, because I drank all of the Simon's ones while I was waiting for your questions earlier. <laughs> this is um, from another little pub down in Victoria called Dainton's. Um, this is their double okay. hazy IPA. All right. Well, it's good to hear that you're well stocked. Uh, Chris. Here's a question from our audience. Do you think we'll see more sub-region focus in the Yarra soon? I, I hope so. I think the Yarra has um, at least or a couple of broad distinctions and who knows how many smaller ones. Um, each of them have their merits. I mean, obviously I'm biased because I spend most of my time in the upper Yarra, but the other regions I think have some fantastic um, or sub-regions as well, they all have their different characteristics. It's one of the reasons I have my Yarra Pinot because it's a blend of uh, one of the northernmost and one of the southernmost vineyards of the Yarra, both contribute different things. One, I think, contributes more the nose and the beautiful fruit, and the other one contributes more to the palate and the power. So north for the nose and south for the palate in this case. I've got a general question that's come through. Uh, do you ever need to add acid that far south? Does anyone care to comment? I want to say, Ricky, you're further south than us. Does that apply Ricky, to you? Ricky, you're the further south. You can go for this one. <laughs> I, was, I was waiting for that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, We. I mean, when I worked at Bay of Fires, I mean, yeah, certainly. I mean, you need to look at the numbers a little bit. Um, pH can be driven up by a number of factors and we're obviously all a little bit aware of Britannomyces, which, um, you know, in certain circumstances, you'd rather acidify than hang your wine out there to dry a little bit in the case of um, spoilage. So, yeah, there's also a bit of a balance. So typically if you're picking early enough, um, and you've got flavour, that's the main thing. And that a lot of that's based on site and yield and there's a number of factors that um, determine this. But, uh, yeah, in Tasmania, certainly plenty of people will be acidifying for sure. Uh, Ricky, well, this is another general question, but I'll direct it to you. Uh, how do you judge the ripeness of stems in whole bunch? Um, oh, well, there's two two trains of thoughts um for me i guess things that are going to go 100 percent whole bunch i'm going through and we're selectively picking for that so uh we'll identify parcels that we really like that well, i i don't know why i refer to we but i really like and um you know, where stems are lignifying nicely, so we'll pick those out first and treat them separately. But in terms of other parcels, we might do 20%. It's just kind of a fruit density thing. So if that parcel seems like it might be able to carry that savoury element, that's what we're looking for there, is that savoury to balance out that sweetness and the depth of flavour. Chris, would you have anything to add about that, how you judge the ripeness of stems in whole bunch? That's part of what I've said about splitting it out into doing a 100% ferment and a 0% ferment because then you always have the option of blending it back in depending on how ripe it is. Um, 
And depending on the year, like 17, which was quite a late harvest for us, and you can get more ripeness um, into the stems as opposed to, say, um, 19, which is a crazy early vintage. Um, it's harder to pick and get it right. So for me, that's, that's sort of the philosophy behind keeping a portion separate and giving yourself the option to blend it in later. And Ricky, this may be the last question for tonight. How was, oh, no, we've had another one come through. Uh, Ricky, how was Vintage 2020 in, in Tamer? Um, <laughs> oh, challenging, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, probably the most challenging that I've had as a winemaker, to be honest. Um, we had a very dry summer, like most places did. We obviously had bushfires on the mainland. Tasmania wasn't affected by that much. Um, but I guess the season kind of, it kind of broke and we had a lot of rain events through the picking season. But I kind of feel like often in those years where we're forced to pick based on rain events, the wines are actually in some cases better. So if you're on top of your vineyards and you're looking after them and your yields are balanced, you get through quite nice and you pick the wines on the early side and things are really fresh and vibrant. So that's probably what I'm seeing in the Pinots at the moment. I'm not incredibly excited, but I'm probably also bracing myself for, it hasn't been perfect, um, but I guess that's our job as winemakers is to, uh, you know, take the punches and take the hits and um, make the best of it. And yeah, there'll be some pretty cool wines for sure. Chris. Where do you get your Mornington fruit from? Uh, it's from a vineyard on the Bitten Dramana Road. Um, it's actually called Bitten Estate. Um, so planted, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was 25 or 26 years ago and was a blend of um, 114, 115 and MB6 clones. There you go, incredibly detailed. <sighs> Gang, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us. We fielded all of our questions. Ricky, Chris, Tara, thank you so much for your time. Have a good evening. So with that, uh, we have done it for our tasting. We're done for our tasting this evening. Uh, our next event is on Thursday. So register now. We're, we're looking at the topics of New South Wales and ACT as well as alternative varieties in the Barossa. And for any of our tasting events, you can jump onto Langton's website and order yourself some of the wines. In, it, in every event, there's two wines from the event featured in, in Langton's mix, six packs and dozens that they put together. And also it's the last week of voting for our people's choice. We're encouraging you to get on board and help us decide who is going to be the number one winemaker of 2020. So all you need to do is, is get onto our website and choose between the list of 50 winemakers, register a vote, and by voting, you're going to go into, into a draw to win a bunch of amazing prizes, one of which is a leave hair seller, the best thing you can get for your home. This, is, this happens to be a leave, leave hair seller. This is an amazing seller. It's dual zone. It's got UV glass on the front, so it protects the wines from the sun. It's got low vibration. There's a charcoal filter within it, so it, uh, it purifies the air going into, the, into there. And, and when you open up these gorgeous brushed, brushed uh, stainless steel doors, you'll find that it's got some gorgeous uh, beech wood shelving within there. We've also got a hotel stay down at the Jackalope on Mornington Peninsula. It's, uh, it's one of the best luxury hotels in Australia. And whilst you're down there on the Mornington Peninsula, we'll arrange uh, private cellar tastings with Mike Alwood of Ocean 8 and Rollo, Rollo Crittenden of Crittenden Wine. And they're two past Young Gun of Wine Awards winners. And as well, for everyone entering, we've got a year's supply of wine to go away to one lucky winner. Not to everyone that enters, but we're going to draw the names out of a hat or a barrel and you might be one of the lucky ones to win one of the above prizes or a year's supply of wine. 
So check out our website, register for our next event, get voting. We'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us.